This is Trophy Dark, the Flocculent Cathedral, part one of a planned two part game. I wanna start by having everybody introduce themselves. So when I call on you, please say your name, your pronouns, and anything else you'd like for us to know about you. I will start, my name is Jason. I use he, him, they is also fine. And I am one of the publishers of Trophy Dark. And I have been involved with the whole Trophy line of games from the very beginning. I'm not the author or the creator, but I was right there when they were being created. So, um, and I've run it probably 9,000 times. So um, I'm a big, big trophy guy, love trophy. Um, let's go over to uh, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob. Um, I use he, him, and they is also fine. Um, I'm just a fairly frequent player of Trophy. Uh, I have never played this incursion before, but um, yeah, looking forward to it. Fabulous. Thank you, David. My name is David. Uh, I use he, him, and I'm part of the Gauntlet Publishing team. Uh, I'm a big fan of Trophy getting to play a lot of gold lately, but I haven't gotten to play dark in a few months. So I'm very excited to be a doomed treasure hunter instead of a desperate treasure hunter once That is again. the difference, right? Yeah, doomed versus desperate. Mads. Hi, I'm Mads. Um, she, her, and um, currently playing in the Between Shadow Society. Um, so my first introduction to um, uh, games on Gauntlet. And uh, this is definitely my first game of Trophy Dark. So I'm excited for this. I think you're gonna have a good time. And Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda, she, her. Uh, I have played Trophy Dark before once uh, in the Gauntlet online community gaming, um, which is a lot of fun, fun place to be. Uh, and we had a really great time with our incursion. So I'm very excited to have this amount of horror, I suppose, happen to me. <laughs> Awesome, I love it. It wasn't the Flockland Cathedral that you played, the incursion, was it? It sure was. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. You get to do it again. <laughs> so. Hey, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. We'll see how it turns out differently. I'm sure it will be very different. Um, okay, so fabulous. Let's do CATS. Um, CATS, of course, is an acronym that stands for Concept, Aim, Tone, and Subject Matter. I like to do CATS in order to establish some basic expectations for what's going to happen over this week and next week. And so let's start with concept. The concept of Trophy Dark. Trophy Dark is a fantasy horror game with an emphasis on the horror part of it. It is about doomed treasure hunters in an environment, usually a forest, but sometimes not. Uh, in an environment that does not want them there. <laughs> um, the characters are together in the beginning. And um, as the game progresses, they might be less together. They might start like betraying each other in order to stay alive. And ultimately they are probably going to either be dead or changed very, very negatively by the end of the game. That is what Trophy Dark is all about, hence the dark in the name. Uh, this particular incursion, the Flocculent Cathedral, is what we at Trophy HQ consider the sort of uh, intro incursion, like it's the one we always run for, for new folks, and uh, we recommend that new GMs run it as well. Um, I don't want to say anything else about it, but that's just sort of what it is at the outset. The aim of the characters is to reach the center of this marshy forest in order to acquire the fabulous treasures that are there in order to satisfy their drive. The aim of the players is to tell a good story. So as I noted, these characters are doomed, probably, most likely. And that means that we embrace a really particular play ethos in Trophy Dark, that, which we call play to lose. <laughs> so what that means is you are playing to tell a good story, even if that means your character is, is destroyed or insane or whatever by the end of it, right? So um, it's a little Lovecraftian in that way, actually. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's play to lose. The aim of us as a play group, we are going to first make characters after I'm done with my spiel, and then we'll introduce them. And then we will begin the incursion. The incursion has five rings. We'll do ring one and ring two today. 
and then we'll do ring three, four, and five next week. At the end of each session, we'll have stars and wishes. The tone of the game, as you might imagine, is dark and it can be kind of scary and horror horrific, or at least as much as a role-playing game can be anyway. And um, it has creepy elements. It has, occasionally it has body horror elements. Um, there's a lot of like just darkness um, and we, we revel in that. The subject matter, um, so the incursions all have listed subject matter things. And so this particular one has listed alcohol, body horror, drowning, insects and spiders, manipulation and religion. Um, we are gonna have lines and veils in play and I will encourage all of you to go uh, note your lines and veils on the uh, tab of the character keeper once I share that. We also will have the X card in play. Um, we've all played together so you know how it works and as well as the open door policy. So are there any questions about cats? Okay, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and we will make characters. Okay, let's go ahead and meet our characters. I'm gonna go in reverse order of the sheet. So when it's your turn, please say your character name, your occupation, your background, your drive, your skills, any rituals you have, and your starting ruin. Basically just read. <laughs> read the character sheet. <laughs> if you know anything else about your character up to this point, you can also tell us that, but it's okay if you don't, because we're going to learn as we play. So, uh, David, please tell us about Torum. Torum, yeah, I'm playing Torum. He is now a woodcutter who used to be an oppressed laborer. He escaped from whatever work he was in, where he was routinely forced to use his, uh, his ability, his ritual clay, to uh, to rearrange and reshape inanimate material um, where he's paid just insanely low wages. Um, he got out of that because he needed something more lucrative so that he could buy his brother's freedom from Barsoul prison. And the thing that he could come up with was wood cutting, which is crazy that that's paying better than this rearranging thing that uh, he was doing before. But that's the truth. And indeed, you're going the extra step of delving into um, places in the world that don't want you there to find that are more, that's yeah. even more lucrative than woodcutting. <laughs> you know? The woodcutting made him familiar with the, with the forest enough that he is cautiously optimistic that he could actually go and get some treasure and that would free his brother like, you know, this decade instead of the end of his life. Fabulous. I love it. Thank you. Um, Let's go to Rob and Gaspar. Uh, Gaspar is a, sorry, I've lost my tab. Is an enlightened miner who is now a nest. Um, his drive is to resurrect the cult of Darawan. Um, so I think he was, he was a miner who found something under the earth that set him on this path of, uh, religious or cultic belief. Um, he is, he wears a very a sort of heavy but ragged cloak with a hood and his, and every piece of exposed skin you can see is covered with intricate tattoos. He has two rituals, burrow, which allows him to move through the ground and darkness, which allows him to uh, create a living shadow that snuffs out all nearby light. Fantastic, thank you. And let's go to Amanda and Laura. Laura is, hmm, she, she used to be an artist and she still feels a very strong drive towards creating art, but she hates everything she creates and ends up destroying it even before it's done. Um, She's very, she's an uninspired artisan. Uh, as she sought out different inspirations, she did find out about um, an object called Cormoran's Wheel that she believes will give her back her inspiration. 
And in order to track down this wheel, she has taken up the job of assassin because sometimes to get the things you need, you have to kill the people who have it and might as well get paid for that. She has two rituals, Night Walk, which is move untraceably through the darkness, and Carve, which is alter a creature or object via sorceress subtraction. Interesting. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And let's go to Mads and Kel. Kel is, under his perpetually tousled hair, a pretty boy, and uh, he used to be a cupbearer, a bit... Uh, underhanded for what he's done. But he was an entertainer and he would um, be an appealing to those he would call mistress and entertain guests and followers of the particular courts he was in. And he is able to alter his voice or make it come from far away for one of his rituals. And if need be, he can strike at the weakest point of an object with phantasmal force, with fault. And his skills are, of course, performance and rituals, a bit of trickery. And um, yeah, he starts off with three ruin. <laughs> Very good, thank you. And... Great. I want to talk about just a couple of like sort of mechanical things or and sort of gameplay things related to Trophy Dark that you should know about as we start. The first is that the incursion is what we call the adventure or the scenario. And it's quite linear. You move from ring one to ring two to ring three to ring four to ring five. But within that linearity, the story takes place kind of like in the left and right of it, right? Like we, while you're in ring one, we're gonna learn about your character and how you interact with each other. We are going to see different things happen and eventually you're gonna move on to ring two, right? Um, so the thing about it is that the incursion is quite a skeletal structure. There are just some kind of basic details that I know and some flavor things that I have access to, but it's pretty um, open. And so a lot of the storytelling and a lot of the, the meat of our tale is actually gonna come from you all. So Trophy Dark is a pretty collaborative game. We're all used to playing the between together, which has a pretty strong collaborative element. Trophy Dark is even more so. So um, the main way that this collaboration is mechanized is through a die roll called the risk roll. The risk roll is the principal die roll that happens whenever we need to resolve um, an encounter or an obstacle. Now the risk roll, part of the risk roll that is so collaborative and important for the storytelling is uh, this thing called the devil's bargain. So what that means is if you're doing a die roll, you can accept the devil's bargain from myself or another player in order to get another die for your die pool, right? And the devil's bargain is something that takes place no matter what, whether you succeed at what you're doing or whether you fail at what you're doing, the devil's bargain happens, okay? And I like to do a couple of examples. So let's imagine that, um, let's imagine for example that, um, Kel is trying to jump across a ravine, right? And the devil's bargain is offered, well, no matter what, Kel, you are going to drop your weapon, okay? And so if you succeed, it means your weapon maybe like came loose or out of your hand and you dropped it down the ravine. You know, if you fail, it falls down the ravine because Kel also fell down the ravine, right? Um, <laughs> but that's, that's how devil's bargain works, right? Um, that's a pretty simple devil's bargain. A more interesting devil's bargain might be Kel, no matter what, on the other side of the ravine is a soldier from one of the lords you betrayed, right? That would be a really, really fun devil's bargain. Um, 
And so that's just an idea of how you can kind of shape the story, right? You can you can use the devil's bargain, especially to shape the story and 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 just go for it. Like it's, you know, think of like cool things and that's that's always the best answer. But sometimes you don't have a great idea and that's okay. Or you just want to do the simple thing that it seems the most like obvious and that's okay too. Um, but where you're able to look for opportunities to to really shape the story in interesting ways. And if you need some inspiration for that, always look at your drive or in the case of offering a character a devil's bargain, um, their drive, right? That, those, are the, those are the touchstone things to look at for sure. So that's just a little bit of like kind of the gameplay. Another thing about the gameplay that I wanna mention is that this can be a, uh, a player versus player situation, uh, especially as we get toward the end. In the beginning, one of you at least pretty soon, pretty quickly is going to need to betray the group in order to stay alive. <laughs> and so once those betrayals start happening and starts putting pressure on the group, and by the time you get to ring five, you might, you might be fully at each other's throats or like competing to get to the heart of the incursion. And then we have this role called the contest role. We always have the contest role, which lets us sort of resolve those challenges. But um, so just be aware that you are all together. We don't dwell on why you're together or how you got together. We know why you're together, but we'll dwell on how you got together. We'll explore that as we play. But you might start to drift. <laughs> it might start to be uh, drift. And that's part of that play to lose thing, right? Because to be uh, an adventuring party that is at, that is betraying each other, that's uh, that's losing, which is what we love in this game. So, um, and I think that's pretty much it. Are there any questions about the characters or about the rules or anything else before we begin? Okay, so we're gonna take a little break before we start ring one, but before we do, a bit of poetry for the Flockland Cathedral. I'll spell that for you too. It means fluffy moss. <laughs> that is, and that's our theme as well, moss. So, the Flockland Cathedral. Saint who spilled their blood for me, lain in flocculent reverie, I seek your light upon my brow. I would be your trophy now. Chained within this dank domain, your relics, all that I retain, all your teachings I avow. I would be your trophy now. This foul entombment of your will, I would not see you slumber still. No quarter to what men allow. Take me as your trophy now. I'll see you in five. Ring one. You are standing at the edge of the gloaming mire, a mangrove dense fen that is rumored to hold the flocculent cathedral at its heart. Your hope is that once you find the flocculent cathedral, you will be able to wrest its treasures from it in order to sell them so you have enough money to meet your drive. And we'll discuss your drives in more detail as we go. But for now, let's talk a little bit about the Gloaming Mire, this very, very swampy forest. I think as you're making your way through the outer edge of it, you'll notice signs of life. People live in the outer edge of the Gloaming Mire, even if they don't live deeper in. You'll notice at one point, for example, two dozen skulls, their tops neatly sawed off. And they've been arranged to form planters from which garishly colored carnivorous pitcher plants grow. And there are fat iridescent horseflies buzzing languidly around them. Someone else has made a broad shallow pond and filled it to capacity with foot long koi, each with a thick mottled coat of slimy multicolored moss covering it like fur. A question for you all. What sign do you each see that shows that living on the edge of the mire takes its toll on those who dwell there? 
in a way that city life never would. Like, how do we know that this place is a hard place to live? Whoever has a thought first can speak. So we're saying there are, there are people that live out here. They yeah, all true. have, they all have in their, in their, in their hair on their head and in their beards and even on their arms and legs, um, a, a tinge of moss co coloring. And I think it's actually like lichenous moss that grows upon them. Everybody that lives out here is very strong and has very wiry muscles, even the children as if they would not survive if they couldn't run very fast or be very strong for certain situations. Or wade through water a lot, right? Yeah. Any any time we come close to habitation here, there's this kind of low hanging smoke because the the fuel that they're burning in their in their fireplaces is just dank and sodden and you know not not dried out. So there's this low hanging smoke blending with the mist all around all around any dwelling places. Any of the signs of habitation, whether it be um, their architecture or their um, decoration, any indication of living space has a weight to it. It's on a tilt, it's offset, it's not like straight at all because of the weight of the mire and just the living conditions. What is this hot, wet, muggy place like for you as individuals? How have you adapted as you've arrived at the Glomic Mire? How have you, how are you adapting for the discomfort of this place? I think we see Gaspar with this, this ragged kind of cloak he wears and he's still wearing it up over his head and, and but the bits of exposed skin we can see are just a, a kind of just almost slimy with, with sweat and grease and dirt and just, you know, he's, he's just sweating but not really trying to do anything to alleviate that. Laura's uh, leather boots are basically up to her waist. They're the tallest boots she could possibly get a handle on um, that are as waterproof as possible because she knows that she's going to be probably wading through a lot of muck. She's also tucked up her dark cloak um, with various buttons and tacks so that she can bring it up or release it down sort of like um, a, a bride's train. Um, so that when she needs it down to stay warm, she can have it. And when she doesn't want it to be drugged through swamp, it can be pinned back up. We're going to have a marriage and we're going to our bossy chapel <laughs> to get married to the saints or something. I don't know. Kel, how have you adapted? Kel is uncomfortable. He's used to more scented and pampered um, surroundings, but what he will do is he will cover up his hair and cover up his hands for the most part, just to try to keep the damp away and then just kind of huddles in his, in his jacket um, as much as he can. Tomorrow? Um, Torum is been, has been most concerned about the moisture um, and took pains uh, to prepare on on the way here and before even leaving by covering all of uh, all of the seams of his pack and his boots and everything else that he can think of uh, with with tree sap. Um, he has wrapped his his axe head in uh, in a in a cloth that that was um, really uh, like formed with with tree sap um, to try and protect the metal. He's not sure how how good of a job it's really doing because he's never tried to do this before. He just knows 
That's what you need to do if you're trying to keep the damp away. Unfortunately, the side effect of all this is that it's it's warm. It's particularly warm. And um, in the humidity, it's even, it feels even warmer because it's exhausting. Thank you, everyone. You sort of get past this outer edge of the gloaming mire that is occupied by people, it's still not a ton of people, right? And you start to get into the deeper fen. And mercifully, the sun is starting to be low in the sky, easing up the heat a little bit. Up ahead, you hear the sound of revelry, of celebration. About a dozen people, you can hear laughing, you can hear singing. By implication, there's probably quite a lot of drinking. And based off some of the conversation, which touches on violence enacted against poor people on the road, you gather that this is a group of bandits up ahead. You are aware of them. They're not aware of you yet because they're too caught up in their celebration. But you will have to figure out a way around this group of bandits in order to get deeper into the mangrove forest which you find yourself in. The mangrove forest is not easy to navigate. There is a path that you're following to get deeper. And regrettably, these bandits are on that path, right? And so I think at this point, I will just turn over the scene to all of you. And whenever you wanna have a plan or decide how you're gonna get past these all, these folks, um, we'll discuss it. But for now, role play. Uh, Laura kind of dips in towards her, her fellow explorers and says very quietly, I can sneak up on them and get a better look if uh, we plan to attack or if we plan to move around, we're going to need to know exactly where they are. I can kill their lights. If you kill their lights, they're going to know something's going on. But by that time, we can be long gone. Fair enough. They won't know it's anything to do with us or anything. There's so many things out in this forest. Perhaps, perhaps that would be good, but it would be good to know their position before. Well, how does it work? Will we be able to see? I will be able to see, and then I'll have to come back and tell you. Well, I think Torum was talking about the darkness ritual specifically. Uh, <laughs> we can you say, know how many are there first. Very good. Perhaps Laura should scout ahead. So Laura, if you're scouting ahead, let's talk about, this is an opportunity to do the risk roll. So if you all want to follow along with the rules, there's a reference tab. And the rolls are in the center there, and the risk rolls at the very top. When attempting a risky task, declare what you hope will happen, and then ask the rest of us uh, what could go wrong. Um, so what are you hoping to accomplish here? I'm going to use my ability to nightwalk uh, and move untraceably through this forest uh, to sneak up onto these, this bandit group see where they are, how many there are, how drunk they are, uh, just kind of scout out the, the situations so that we can make a proper plan. I love it. And now the rest of us as players, not characters, we get to say, if we wish, what we think could go wrong if Laura fails. Um, David, Mads, Rob, any thoughts on what fell outcomes could be waiting for Laura out here. I wonder if these bandits have been preying on 
local people on the road. It's possible that there's a group of a group of their victims out for revenge that Laura doesn't see, but are kind of watching, also watching the bandit camp and maybe watching her. Oh, that's intriguing. That could be a good devil's bargain too. Um, I'll say that quite simply, you get captured. You get waylaid by one of their guards. I mean, not everybody's going to be partying, so. Um, I mean, what could go wrong is like, you can't, you just can't find them. Like you keep wandering around and you can't find them. That could be like the magic doing that too, right? Like maybe the magic leads you astray. Okay, these are all great ideas. Um, I'll make a decision if you fail or what actually happens. But for now, let's talk about your dice. So you're gonna take one light die if your background or occupation have given you skills that can assist you. So let's take a look at your skills. One of my skills is stealth. So I think that Perfect. should be pretty easy, yeah. So you have your first light die. You take another light die for accepting a devil's bargain from another player or myself. Devil's bargains are complications that will occur whether you succeed or not. And my favorite move is to always steal, uh, reframe, steal and reframe someone's uh, failure suggestion into a devil's bargain. And I'm going to say that there is a murderous, vengeful party out there in the gloaming mire that you might uh, that you may have to run into and deal with playing with Rob's idea. I wasn't going to take the devil's bargain, but that sounds fun. <laughs> And we get, you might have three more options too. Yeah. So obviously um, the GM could, could veto, but I, I would say no matter what, what you encounter are not human, uh, not a human party. I love it. Oh, that's so tempting. <laughs> I didn't want to take a devil's bargain so early, but uh, I'm that's going a... to, because that's fun. <laughs> That's a Rob why I'm always in trouble well. in games. <laughs> I okay. just love the non-human party so much. I'm just like, I'm, I'm not yeah, going to say anything. That's so good. Yeah. I guess you got two options. It sounds like we're going with that I mean, one. The, one I, the only other one I was thinking of was that maybe there are like, the sound sounds like a smallish group of bandits, but when you get closer, you realize this is a huge, a huge mob of... Yeah. So Amanda, are you taking the non-human thing yeah okay good it's just it's too fun how could i not how could you not indeed um great you got two light dice and you said you're doing your ritual right yes okay which is the night walk ritual so that uh, you have to take a dark die because of that yeah. and so on the die roller you'll do forward slash risk uh two one to represent two light dice one dark die two space one uh, yeah, it's risk space two space one. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so you got a three, a three, and a one. Uh, a three is a fail, <laughs> and so um, you will. Uh, I'm going to say you're captured unless you want to add a dark die and try again. You get to do because the dark die is not the highest in the in the. In yeah. the three, you get to try again if you wish. So. I would like to try the dark die. Yes. Okay, so add a dark die and now roll risk two, two. Oh my gosh, this is fine. Hey, there you go. That's a good result. <laughs> so the high, light, light is high. So, and it's a six. A six is a full success. So basically, I'll tell you what you see, but just give me the the ritual. What does it look like? As you're and, and and you're sneaking up, like what is that like? I think it's very subtle at first. Like if you're if you're not paying attention, you might not even notice. Uh, and you'd look back and she's gone, but she just sort of almost like a chameleon starts to blend into the background. She's not actually blending in. She's she's disappearing but it looks like just parts of her are starting to take form of the background um, until she's just not visible at all and it is 
a silent ritual. There's no words say to it. She just quietly does it as she walks into this forest. It looks like she's becoming part of it. I would like to check in with the others while you're all waiting on Laura to report back. Um, let's just have the scene with the three of you. Uh, Torum is like sitting there idly uh, whittling with, uh, with a small knife at, at a, a branch that he has pulled off of a tree. It's like a nervous habit. How long is this going to take? Going to take as long as it's going to take. We should have just done Gorham's plan. We should have just we should have just gone dark and, and, and snuck past. There is still time. And Gaspar is just kind of squatting down in the in the dirt and dirty ground and, and kind of rooting around in the soil. What are you doing? Why rubbing there? I have an affinity for the things of the earth. What does that mean? Gaspar just smiles without looking toward you. Um, Torum sees like a small, a small critter like scooting past and 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 in in like uh in like a startle he he throws the little whittled sharp end at it i don't think he hits it it's making me more jumpy i was going to say i think we see the the little critter just like run past and then it runs towards gaspar and runs up this runs up his sleeve and disappears what was that you have a pet? Evidently, he is. He has an affinity for small, creepy things as well. Oh, small, oh creepy goodness. things can be very useful, such as the one we have sent ahead of us to scout. Large is that shadow that you cast. Anyway. As large as I trick. as large as I need it to be. Large Can enough. Anyone Can anyone learn it? It's not so much something I learned as something I was shown. Or something you are. Or something I could become. Torum like makes a sign of a saint and like moves a little further off. And he's just mumbling to himself like, Bad business, bad company, bad company for bad business. What am I doing out here? Laura, you are approaching the, the camp and there is a fire in the center, but the first sign that you get that something is unusual or wrong about this scene is that it's a fire that is burning without an apparent fuel source. There are no pieces of wood. <laughs> there are no, it's just a fire sort of hovering in the middle of the space. And the light is low because it's, you know, that's, it's getting to be sundown. And also the trees are, you know, make it seem even darker, but you can see just enough in the shadows there are about a dozen figures, especially around the fire, you can notice that they, you see boots, you see cloaks, you see the sorts of things you'd expect to see, 
but the thing that you do not notice, the thing that seems off is that despite the sounds of revelry and celebration and jocularity and drinking and laughing, you hear all of this, but the figures are perfectly still. And as you get closer, you notice that they are skeletal. They are moldy. They have moss dripping from the bones. And importantly, there are plants weaving in and out of sockets and jaw bones and ribs. And it's almost like you can see just a gentle movement of these skeletons as they make their sounds. It's almost like the forest itself is, is causing them to, um, to speak, luring you there. I know that you have to step away, Amanda, do you need to step away right now or, no, okay. Um, please make a ruin roll. We make a ruin roll whenever you see or experience something disturbing. So roll forward slash ruin. You got a five. If your current ruin is uh, lower than five, then your ruin is going up by one. So what does that put you up at? Uh, that moves me from a three to a four. Please tell me how you feel right now as you see this scene. I think Laura walked into this forest expecting strange things. You don't, you don't walk into a place like this without having heard some stories. But this is, this is a little more than expected. This is very frightening and creepy. And I think she's just extremely, extremely unsettled. You're gonna get a condition because your ruin went up. Uh, we'll talk about the condition in a little bit. But for now, I will tell you that they've done a pretty good job with this setup. Um, it's not just an auditory illusion, or it's not just this sort of, they, they get you close enough and you see that there are open chests with silver and other things spilling out for their temptation. What do you do? I mean, Laura's goal isn't necessarily money, but money doesn't hurt. Goodness. I think if she's unsettled enough, though, she probably wouldn't go near it at the moment, not without backup. So I think she's going to take note of it, take solid note of exactly where this money is in case, you know, she wants to come back and get it um, and step away. I think bumbling nearby is Torum mumbling to himself. like nearby the camp, the, the bandit camp, or? Uh, nearby uh, Laura's position. Oh, okay, very good, yeah. We can pick up with that scene, go for it. I, I don't think I can perceive you or anything because you're still in your, in your ritual state. So I'm just, I'm just, ugh. It could be possible that when she kind of loses her concentration a little bit, it being unsettled, the complication, there could be a complication with that where it kind of, she's kind of fading it back into visibility a little bit, just to make the drama more fun. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think that happens like really, really close to Torum and he's, he's, and he like gives a jump and, uh, and rustles a bush a little bit. It's like, Oh, these are just the worst kinds of companions. I cannot believe. What did you find? Shh, quiet. There's something here. Don't, don't get close. 
Um, he reaches over his back and, and, and looses his ax out and kind of creeps closer to you. What do we need to do? I, I say we get close. I'm staying low. I'm just should we just get the others and move past or maybe just move past? I don't know. There's all this there's all this coinage and and coins and he like <laughs> looks up. Torum, are you gonna go look at the scene as well? I yeah, I'll I'll peek up and look at the, it is, at the mention of money. It is as I described. And one of the skeletons being operated marionette-like by the vines and plants actually moves its skeletal hand and the plants taut and the vine like sort of tightens and twists to make the finger, the skeletal finger point at the treasure. (laughs) Please make a ruin roll. Okay, a one. How are you feeling? Uh, I cope with this all right. I think it's because I have a background in rearranging and reshaping inanimate material. This just feels like a like a prop to me. Like it doesn't seem like a like a cursed place. It seems like a, an elaborate trap. So then, what do you do? Well, that's nothing to be too afraid of. It's just some wizardry. Come on, we just have to be careful. We can get the coin. I'm not sure this is if if this is wizardry then where's the wizard they make things I don't know how it works I'm gonna cut things I'm gonna cut in briefly and say that Kel they've been gone a bit and you actually can hear their very loud whispering up ahead (laughs) there's a clear like audible whisper happening Um, a sort of argument what do you do Hell whispers back to Gaspar, what the devil are they doing? We can can hear them. Gaspar chuckles softly and perhaps it's time for us to join them then. What choice do we have? It's either go or stay and listen to them argue where people can come up on them. Oh my God. Oh my Um, God. Torum makes his way like rather directly back to the two of them and is like, Kel, Kel, there's something up here that you need to take a look at. We could hear you the whole time. What? It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not a bandit camp. It's, it, it looks like it's just a bit of artifice. We need, we need your skills to see if we can dismantle it. There's treasure. At that, Kel is point me in the direction. What are you doing, Gaspar? Gaspar has kind of a wry smile on his face and he follows along as they head toward the bandit camp. So you both will see what I've described previously. And I think because Torum and Laura, or Torum especially, has sort of prepared you for the sight of it, I'm not going to make you roll ruin. But I do want to know, Kel, what do you do? Coinage in a chest, or is it like just laid out in pile? It's yeah, it's it's kind of both. It's it's meant to look enticing. Yeah, it's like some in a pile, some in a chest. I'm gonna do a ritual because I mean I'm not touching that shit until I know <laughs> it's fine. So I'm so gonna, gonna do, do fault. I'm gonna do uh, fault. Strike the weakest point of an object with phantasmal force. So let's do the risk roll. What are you hoping to accomplish? Uh just basically for the part of it that's in a chest just to be sure that there's nothing in it, like mm-hmm. like besides the coinage and just making sure that if there is a trap, then I set it off and then we can gather coinage, you know, f- fairly free and clear, mm-hmm. so. Group, Rob, David, Amanda, what could go wrong here? 
um, this it's a total misread of the situation and these things will attack. I was thinking the same thing too, like the 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 skeletons come alive or they they're it might be a little janky, but the forest is making them like move toward you. Yeah, it just alerts them to our presence, basically. Yeah, let's say the same thing. This is the, I don't know, the enticing bit of something over the net trap kind of deal. Let's talk about your dice here. So you have the ritual skill, so you get your first light die pretty straightforwardly. But then the second light die is for accepting a devil's bargain. And let's talk about devil's bargains. I'm going to say that one of said skeletons has markings indicating they are or were a member of the swirling court. That's my offer. David or Rob, any offers? Um, no matter what, it angers the forest. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to top that at the moment. You have two offers, Kel. Either the forest is angered no matter what, or one of the skeletons bears markings of the swirling court, or you can reject them both and just roll one light die. So. Oh, you're muted, Nats. Um, I'll do the devil's bargain of uh, the swirling court. Skeleton. Very good. And you have to do the dark die because of the uh, fault ritual. So go ahead and roll risk forward slash risk two one. Nice. The dark die is high, which means you have to stop. And it's a five, which is a success. Um, if your current ruin is lower than five, however, your ruin goes up. And uh, but there's a complication as well from said uh, five. So I'll take the narration. We'll talk about your, uh, your ruin increase in a bit because it is going to go up by one. But for now, well, give, give me the ritual part. What does your ritual look like? So when Kel activates his, his fault ritual, um, he is basically um, making hand gestures. It's like it's a very it's a very somatic component where he's making hand gestures of um, pretty much entwining his fingers together and then cracking them open and then creating the um, the force going into the weakest part of of whatever he's directing into. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, that's good. The complication, quite simply, is that the money is not real. You, you do the thing, and I mean, you're learning something. Uh, you're, the force hits it, and it just like it just dissipates. It's just a, it's just an illusion. And you could now, at this point, if you wish, just easily skirt around this encampment and continue on your way through the mangrove forest hoping to reach the Flocculent Cathedral, except Kel, one of the skeletons propped up within a tangle of vines, bears a shirt, tattered, moldering, but with the symbol, spiraling symbol of the swirling court. Tell us about the Swirling Court. Why is it so important that you join? I gave up 
my last position. Well, I didn't give up my last position. I was kicked out because the lady of the house decided she wanted to have some fun. And I spiked her Lord's drink. It got very hot for me there. And I've heard of the swirling court where there are revelry all the time, betrayal, but all in good fun. And I'm all about fun. So. Why is it so expensive to join that you would drag yourself to the, or why is it so hard to join that you would drag yourself to this miserable place in order to do so? You need resources. You need money. You need, you need to show you have status in some way. If you can't, well, the saying is, fake it till you make it, right? So what do you do when you see this symbol of the swirling court on one of these skeletons? Well, after letting loose a very, very um, muttered swear, um, he sees the, the symbol on the, on the shirt and he now wants to go and get it to to show that he could take this person's place. He could be part of that court, knowing now that there's someone who has passed on any which way, and now he has a chance to get there and show that he has a space in the court. You go to collect the shirt and you can, no problem. When you go to collect the shirt, something about this moss covered skeleton reminds you of you. What is it? Or if somebody else has an idea and wants to point it out to Kel, that'd be great too. Not it's it's only, totally a skeleton. Do I, it's just a skeleton, yeah. Okay. Not only does it remind you of you, it's literally wearing the exact same ring you were wearing. That's pretty good. I like that. Well, what is it, <laughs> Laura? What is the ring? Uh, I think it is a ring that's sort of um, like a family sigil stamped into it. Uh, nothing extremely fancy, no jewels or anything, um, just a, a simple silver ring with a sigil on it, but not something that you would just find at any marketplace. Kel, please make a ruin roll. And it happens to be on the, the ring, the pinky finger of yeah. the skeleton. I love it. What am I making? A ruin roll, forward slash ruin. Great. So your rune doesn't go up because it's a two, so you're okay. How do you feel though? He was uncomfortably in a sweat before. I mean, just trying to protect himself from the dank and the mildew of this horrible place. But now seeing that, seeing the ring that matches the one that is currently on his finger is A shudder goes through through his body. He's uh, he's um, yeah. He's not he's not comfortable at all now. Gaspar, this is just a bit of mummery in the forest. There's nothing here, and the Flockland Cathedral beckons. You can easily walk around this display, continuing on down the mangrove path. What do you do? It's time we moved on. There's nothing here for us. It 
seems the danger was an illusion. Uh, and so was the treasure. Come on. This forest, it's playing tricks on us. We have to be very vigilant. Do not let your guard down, not even for a moment. Indeed. As you all press deeper into the mangrove, past this display, the skeletal bandits continue to sing. They're still singing their songs, drunken songs and shanties. And as you make your way through, you can hear the songs for a good long while behind you. These are songs about those who found their way to the flocculent cathedral, but promptly squandered the riches they brought back from the depths of the gloaming mire before it managed to reclaim what was stolen by sorcery, trickery, or simple ill fortune. The songs can be heard echoing through the mangroves. You might even catch snatches of the songs on the wind later on. But a question for everyone. What overheard bit of doggerel verse does each treasure hunter take note of that reminds you of your background? How will this verse help you avoid the fate of those other poor fools who were motivated only by greed? Think on it for a bit. I think Gaspar over here is something about those who delve in, into the earth in search of treasure and the, the fate that they suffer of the earth swallowing them and their fate being lost. fated to be lost between the earth and, and never never return to the daylight. How are you going to avoid that fate? I think Gaspar feels that he has some level of mastery of the realm under the ground and that he can he can move through it in ways that other people cannot, so it's harder for him to become harder for him to become trapped there than a, a, a normal person would. Torum, tell us about the song. Um, this the like this the short little verse that he hears, kind of repeated frequently in his own mind, or maybe echoing in the forest, is uh, the skeleton singing about. The worker being told to work his fingers to the bone till naught but bone remained. And Torum has been thinking about that and how he's not gonna be the one who's told to, to go in first or to, to work so hard that he's the one who is kind of taking the brunt of it all for, for any masters here. He will be at least an equal and he might even try and talk others into into, into doing things that, that they ought to be doing anyways. Laura, tell us about your verse. Laura is trying to tune out most of this song, but a verse does catch her ear and sort of continues in her mind over and over again. And it is a verse about explorers who have made it into this forest and found this flocculent cathedral and couldn't even enter because they didn't understand its its beauty and how uh, astounding and horrific it is at the same time how they didn't appreciate it for what it was they only appreciated it for what it would give them she really latches on to this idea of something so beautiful and inspirational. Uh, so she, she believes that this, is, this might be what she is looking for. Um, she's 
driven to seize absolute control of Cormoran's wheel, which I've discovered is a marketplace, not an item. Uh, so I'm going to retcon that I knew that because uh, <laughs> that's even better. I was um, going to say something, but I was like, ah, whatever, it's nah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't look up the uh, the lore on this, uh, so now I did. Um, and I like I like the marketplace idea better. I think that's a lot more cool. Um, however, inspiration and beauty is inspiration and beauty. And she's she thinks that this is not a thing that will affect her because she will be inspired. Tell, tell us about your verse. Here's one of the one of the melody lines from the skeletons. And it's something like, do not drink from the cup you gave. Your fate of loss will you save. And I mean, it's very sing-songy, but he's <laughs> remembering that last cup that he gave his last Lord. And um, he's thinking on it, maybe not um, live, live a life of betrayal, maybe actually try to be better he's still clutching that shirt that he got from the skeleton and the ring that matches the one that is currently on his finger and um, contemplating, but not quite, not quite sold on the idea yet. I love it. As you all make your way deeper into the mangrove forest, deeper into the gloaming mire, ever closer, you hope, to the flocculent cathedral, where the satisfaction of all your dreams awaits. Kel, you will feel something on your hand, and you will see that between your fingers, if you splay them, are spider webs. And you can feel something beneath your ring, something between the ring and the flesh, wriggling to be free. And Laura, you notice that there is something tickling the roof of your mouth, something, some pr protuberance from your tongue is tickling the roof of your mouth. So passes ring one. Let's take a five minute break. Ring two. Wherein the treasure hunters pass out of the mangrove maze and into an area of thick brambles and stunted trees with marshy soil. The sun was getting low already and you're due for a bit of a rest but just a short one so that you can make the most of the low light the, the, in the morning to where it's not so hot i'd like to have just a little bit of a scene around the campfire if that's okay especially with two of you having discovered some strange things going on <laughs> um, and you can keep that secret or not, it's up to you. And I think I'm gonna, after that, we'll do a little being on watch scene, which I think we'll probably do with, um, uh, have that be Gaspar, I think that sounds fun. So let's just have a little moment around the campfire. Um, Torm returns having carved off some more uh, brittle, fresh wood for the fire, which puts off a, a dank smoke, but there's no damp wood or there, there's no dry wood in this in this forest. So the best wood is still the wood that's like being carved off. Um, he tosses it on the fire. I think the, the trees like creak and groan around. And he looks at them uh, and then sets his ax down and sits down next to the fire and resumes like whittling a thing. 
Ooh. I can still hear them back the way we came, especially when I got a little further out and didn't have the crackling of the flames to drown them out. Are they telling oh. you something? They're singing. Yeah. I hear the singing too. This, um, this flocculent cathedral. I mean, I know we didn't have a specific goal coming in here other than we knew that this is this is where we all wanted to go but uh, I don't know about the rest of you I think it'd be interesting to see this place if it exists in more than just this song oh it's real I've heard about it what what have you heard like song, I mean, that can just as easily be manufactured. It's not a guarantee that it is real. There Hell, nothing's so a guarantee. There wouldn't be so many tales about it if it weren't, if it weren't real. I believe there must be something, some truth to these tales. What is it you're carving there, Torum? Um, you look closely, and you see that right now he's actually not holding a knife. He's just working with his hands, but it looked like he was holding a knife. He's just got a stick and another stick, and he's forming a small mouse-shaped piece of wood. I think Laura laughs a little bit and picks up some of this wet wood, and uses carve the ritual to alter an object via sorcerer subtraction to carve out little pieces and make a even more artistic version of a little mouse. <laughs> nice. We don't need that roll there. I just like it as a scene. It's good. Think, oh, oh, really? That's what we're doing. Yeah, and I'm I'm using clay to reform the wooden into into shapes. That's what I'm I'm sitting here doing. Gaspar smiles and looks into the fire and he sort of puts his puts his hands hands together like this and a, and something small like a mouse just runs out of one sleeve across his hands and, and back up the back up the other one. And Torm's like, oh <laughs> but then, then then he like gives a laugh. He's like, and the the best maker of them all, the one who had one hidden up his sleeve. What about you, Kel? Can you conjure one for us? My talents don't go in that direction, but I can definitely applaud those that can. Oh, I did not create it. I just offer it a, my companionship. I think Laura is laughing a little bit and amused, looks down at this, this little mouse that she had just made and turns it around in her hands sighs and tosses it into the fire. You would toss your own work into oblivion? Why? Just because I made it doesn't mean it. I should have made it. It does not mean it needs to exist anymore. Besides, we need kindling. Torm throws his in. <laughs> Laura laughs again. Let's fast forward to the watch. Everyone takes a short watch so that everyone can get some sleep. But I'm, I'm curious about Gaspar's watch, however. That's what we're gonna do. Gaspar, as you were standing watch, it's dark, just the embers of the fire, providing a little bit of light and quite enough heat on its own because it's still quite muggy even at night here. I'm curious about the cult of Darawan. Tell us about it, why you're trying to resurrect it. I think it has to do with, it has to do with something that Gaspar discovered under the earth, something that he, he found there 
um, regarding a prof the prophesied return of of Darawan and the promises it made him that enabled him to that's where his rituals come from and the the sacrifice he made of of tattooing his flesh to uh to honor this this being this deity or whatever or whatever it is um but it's it's really it's kind of almost like a secret that he wants he wants to share with everyone but doesn't have the words or the doesn't have the way to describe it so he wants he wants this to become a bigger more you know more more people that he wants there to be more people he can share this secret knowledge with of Darawan. While you're on watch, the moon is pretty high in the sky and providing a fair amount of light. And you'll notice across the way, maybe a few hundred paces away, you'll see that there's a raised area, large flat rock on a hill that is positioned to sort of look down on your camp. And you'll see that there are two figures on this flat rock area, sitting there silhouetted by the moonlight, very, very still, possibly watching you all, possibly following you. I'm curious what you do. Are they human looking figures or animal or? Human looking, yeah, you see head, hands, arms. I think, yeah, Gaspar will go over to Laura and who he sees as being the kind of most competent in tackling physical danger, perhaps. And he'll gently shake her awake with, with his hand. What? What is it? We have some company. There are two figures on that hillside watching us. Huh. Well then, let me go take a look. And I'm going to use Nightwalk again. You don't need to, or you I'm can good. say you are, but I don't need a dialogue. <laughs> You go to investigate, and as you get just a little bit closer, you realize that the two figures aren't moving. And they're very, very, very still, not unlike the skeletons from earlier. And as you get closer, you see that in fact, it's a pair of desiccated corpses sitting across from each other. The rotted remains of a picnic lunch laid out between them. Each has a hand placed in the other's mouth, which is filled with a fistful of loamy soil. It's like they just died on the spot and rotted away. Please make a ruin roll. You are going up because you got a six. <laughs> Uh, I, I very much appreciate that this particular dice roller knows how I roll in real life. Because My ruin is now five. Because your ruin is now five, you have unlocked the opportunity to do reduction rolls. A reduction roll is how you lower your ruin. And you lower your ruin by essentially betraying the group or otherwise serving the forest's ends. Okay. And... I will tell you also, because your ruin's going up, that tickling in your mouth, on the roof of your mouth, has become 
more wild and your tongue is moving in your mouth of its own volition. I think Laura clenches her teeth down to try and at least keep it from coming out and being very obvious that this is happening and to keep it from, you know, making her cheeks move and her, her lips move. Um, and I think she's going to go closer to these Man, a ruin of five. She's kind of losing it a bit. I think she's going to go closer to these these corpses to get a better look. Does it look like they were feeding each other soil? It looks like they were feeding each other food as the lovers might do. Mm -hmm. And then they died. <laughs> okay. And rotted in place. And yeah, then it's okay. Because there are the remains of a picnic. Yeah. There as well. Is there any anything on these corpses that might indicate when they got here, how old they are? You know, I would say that it's probably been at least. I mean, probably. I mean, it's been, they're quite quite moldy and moldered, desic desiccated. I'd say it's at least a few months, probably longer. Okay. Maybe longer, just because this environment probably preserves bodies better so it could be years huh. i think laura is going to take note of this scene because it is it is really horrifying but it's also beautiful these two lovers now locked in this this beautiful moment together for all eternity until their bones turn to dust and they return to the soil there's something very artistic and and poetic about that that laura appreciates and she kind of takes that feeling into her heart a little bit and heads back to, to gaspar what do you tell Gaspar? It's nothing. It's no one. It's just it's just bodies. Not not like the skeletons, but yes, just just bodies. It seems that death pervades this place. Death and perhaps rebirth. Well, I didn't mean didn't want to disturb them. I say we just just leave it alone. I apologize for disturbing you. No, it was good. It was good, just in case. But yes, don't trust what is happening in this, and don't don't let your guard down here in this forest. The next, day, not, so. the next day, you're all heading out, you break camp, continue on your trek to the center of the Gloaming Wire. We have seen many signs of death, and yet the Gloaming Mire is absolutely exploding with life. As I paint the scene, please tell me how you experience the profusion, the overwhelming abundance of life in the gloaming mire. Um, there's daylight sounds and there's birds. You can hear the twittering and chattering of animals. Um, Kel's not immune to it because he's used to chatter of courts. He's used to just activity everywhere. So in the silence of darkness, I mean, he just felt very uncomfortable and he wanted to do something. He wanted to, to perform himself. He wanted to, to sing, just 
you know, speak or be amusing, but it's it just felt very um, closed in and not natural. Whereas at least in daylight, listening to the forest speak, at least it's something closer to what he's familiar with. I think Gaspar is wading through this, you know, this some marshy portion of this mire that um, that we're all having to get through. And Gaspar has taken off. He has some sort of heavy, heavy work boots that he wears under his under his cloak, and he take, he's taken those off and tied them around his neck. And you know, every now and again, he's striding barefoot through this mire, and there are every now and again he notices that notices there are leeches, you know, attached to attached to his uh, the flesh of his legs. But he's just he just kind of smiles to himself at that and doesn't do anything to get rid of them. Um. Torum is finding trails and paths to, to, to go along. And it's, it's just absurd. He'll find a game trail and be moving along it. Well-worn game trail. And then out of nowhere, growth, just already, already overcoming the spot. And he'll have to, to pry it away and tear it away and cut it away. And every time he does, uh, just things come flying out, bugs come flying out, birds come flying out. It's like everywhere. Laura's getting a little lost in the scenery, getting a little distracted by what's going on around her. The look of the very small amount of sunlight coming through the, the tree canopy as it hits the bark of the trees, the smell of the soil. At one point she, in a drier spot, she picks up a handful of the soil and watches the worms and the bugs crawl through and fall down off of her hands. And she gives it a big whiff and it just smells so healthy. Just the healthiest soil she's probably ever been around. At one point she notices a snake as it slithers through some moss and catches a small little mouse for, for lunch. And it's just this alive, living forest that is more alive than any other place she's ever been. While we have you, Kel, or Laura, rather, sorry. While we have you, Laura, do you want to take a treacherous action while you're sort of wandering off alone for a bit? How would you serve the forest in order to have the forest's favor? I think as Laura's looking at, at this wondrous and horrific forest that's just astounding to her, she thinks about how it is unfair you know, humans kind of tend to go into a place and just destroy it when they're together in groups en masse. It's a little more fair when the groups are smaller and split up. And so Laura determines to convince the group that at this point in time, it's probably a better idea to split the party just to spread out a little bit more since these game trails are hard to find and then come back together again in the future. I love it. Um, let's have the role first to see if people pick up on your like duplicity here. So the way the reduction role works is no matter what you succeed, I, this, it might still have the old instructions in the, um, in the die roller, but the new way of doing it is no matter what, your, your your ruin goes down just by doing this. But if you roll higher than your current ruin, i.e. a six, then the other treasure hunters are aware <laughs> that you are being treacherous. So uh, go ahead and roll re uh, reduction. Okay, very good. So your ruin goes down and 
no one thinks that you are betraying the group. So. And I'm not. <laughs> exactly. So let's, um, <laughs> let's just have the scene where you're all deciding whether to split up or not. Friends, I believe we may be walking in circles. I believe we may be losing track of where we are. Torm, you are an excellent guide. You are excellent at finding these, these trails, but we are not getting anywhere and soon it will be dark. I believe we should each walk in a different direction, 500 paces, then turn around and come back just to see what we can see. That way we have an idea of what is in each direction at this moment in time. This sounds like this sounds like a, a dangerous proposition. We might all get separated and not be able to find one another again. I don't think we're going in circles because I keep having to cut through game trails, uh, growth in the game trails. But if we're going to divide up, I, I would say we try and move in parallel and keep keep one another in, in sight, at least to, to some degree, and, and perhaps travel in pair so that if something should <sighs> befall one of us, uh, the other one can help them. Yes, yes, that's a great idea, yes. Like a search party. You three seem keen to stick to the drier ground, but I, I feel our path may lay through the mire itself. I will, I will search in that direction. Any volunteers to go with Gaspar in the mire? Gaspar, I will go with you in the mire. My boots should, should be enough to maintain some sort of dryness. I find it is better to just accept that the moisture of this place will find its way in. Yes, Kel, but I don't have to invite it in. Kel, if you have no objections, we'll keep following this path. I have no objections, sir. In fact, and I was going to suggest sticking with you because you at least have something to break through the uh, the undergrowth of this god's awful place. So. Oh, at that, Laura looks at the current uh, cover moss and, and trees and what covering the path and uses carve to just slice it all away. <laughs> I think I think we will also be okay, Cal. So we have two groups. I, yeah, I whispered to Cal, I'm like, they'll be okay, but they'll be full of leeches and moisture. <laughs> We have two Leave groups. them to it. Leave them to it. I think we'll start with Gaspar and Laura. You're making your way through the wetter bits and you start to feel a little, you feel a little tap on your cheek, Laura. And it's a dragonfly that has flown and smacked your cheek. And Gaspar, you start to feel similar. Flying bugs, pop, 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 hitting your face, hitting your shoulder, hitting your hand, pinging against your sword scabbard if you're wearing such a thing. The bugs become thicker. And eventually, quite dense. And before you know it, the two of you are caught in a thick, heavy, being pounded violently by a thick cloud of bugs flying through the air. I need you both to roll ruin, and then we're going to decide how you deal with the situation. Everyone, you're both okay on the ruin front. 
Um, Gaspar, you have a vermin's, vermin skill. You also have a maybe a ritual that may or may not be useful here. I don't know. But what are you going to do to get you and Laura out of this situation as the bugs become thicker and threaten to, they're starting to bite. Uh, they are starting to, they just are flying into your nostrils and mouth at the, such a high velocity that they manage to almost get inside of you. They could split you up. What are you gonna do? Come, Laura. I believe we're on the right path. These creatures are nothing to be, nothing to be frightened of. And I think Gaspar just opens his mouth and allows a few to fly in and then just kind of licks his lips and swallows and you know there are there are bugs crawling in his hair and the inside of his hood and he just doesn't it, it doesn't appear to be concerning him at all and he just keeps trudging off through this swampy ground with his boots hanging around his neck and the bugs battering him and crawling all over his body. At this <laughs> point, Laura, your tongue has pushed its way out of your, between your teeth, out of your mouth. And Gaspar, you can see amidst this like swarm of bugs, you can see Laura's tongue with two little slug-like antenna bobbing and weaving and waving back and forth out of her mouth involuntarily. Please roll ruin, Caspar. Two. You're keeping it together. How do you feel? I think Gaspar feels jealous. <laughs> this is a... Uh, he's host to a number of creatures, he invites them in. But this, you know, this thing, whatever it is that Laura's playing host to, he's, he's it's so intimately connected to be as to be part of her and he kind of looked, narrows his eyes and looks toward it wondering trying to make out what what it is how trying to remember if he saw it before or whether this is something that's she's acquired recently and he doesn't say anything but he's you know he's kind of watching carefully wondering what it is that she knows or has found that he's not yet privy to Torum and Kel, it's a similar situation. The bugs are starting to get quite thick and they start to get so thick that they're just flying into your body, into your face, into your hair, into your mouth, into your ears. Some of them are winged bugs. Some of them are bugs that are not winged at all. They're crawling up from the damp ground, millipedes, centipedes. Torum, your skill of trails and maybe strength and beasts might be most helpful here. What do you do? Um, I think it's just like, this is some kind of rubbish I've never encountered before in the forest. I'm like trying to keep, keep like as much of me covered as I can away from this. Um, and I think I'll even like crouch down at one point and, and push some of the, the loose soil away to reach the solid earth beneath the more solid earth beneath. And I'll try and um, use a uh, clay ritual to uh to to get us a path like make a make a tunnel of earth that will keep the bug at least most of the bugs out so we can pass 
Yeah, or maybe it just creates some kind of like carapace or something, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I love it. Um, let's do a brisk roll. Rob, Matt, Amanda, what could go wrong here? Instead of creating the cover for, you know, um, preventing the bugs from getting in, it's like you mess up somehow where it's actually um, kind of scoping the, the bugs more around us. Um, so it's more possible for them to crawl up and then, you know, like fly at us and, and come around us um, than actually protecting us from, from what's going on. I think that the swarm could get so thick where you're at that it begins to peel the flesh from your body. My suggestion was also gross like that. Um, instead of creating a, a cover from this swarm, you accidentally pull the swarm into your skin and under your skin as sort of a, a body cover of just bugs. It's so vile. <laughs> so you 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 successfully create the cover, but it's just the bugs are so thick that that they are matting on onto this onto this covering and just starting to block out the light, block out all the outside. So you can't see where you are, you can't see where you're going. You're just kind of entombed in in this casing of, of the bugs matting on the matting on this cover you created. Fabulous. Let's talk about dice. Do you have a relevant skill here? Um, so I think trails might be the relevant skill here. Um, but I'm not sure if the ritual counts as part of that skill set or not. I guess not because I don't have the ritual skill, huh? No, but trails might apply if you like if what you're doing with the clay is creating a trail, right? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, perhaps strength. I think I might have to actually be holding it oh, okay. um, a That's little good. bit. Yeah, I like that. You have a light die. Uh, now devil's bargain. Something that will happen no matter what. And who has an offer? I forgot exactly how to say this, but um, because you're holding up the carapace that you've created, things will get in and they will actually burrow into your skin and stay there. I'm going to say no matter what. Oh, wait, let me take a look at your. Oh. I'm going to say that no matter what. Right now in Barsoul prison, something horrible with bugs is being done to your brother. Oh, I was going to suggest uh, something, but I can't. I can't possibly do better than that. <laughs> That's so good. Two offers so far. Yeah, no matter what, there. Some of these bugs are laying eggs in you know in your clothes in your hair so once you escape them they may their offspring may return to plague you at some later point mm. um i think i'll take the barstool prison one because i'm trying to avoid bad things happening with the bugs by doing this risk so i don't want to agree to a bad thing happening with bugs so well except well i guess the difference is like you, you could accept one of those others too and, and it like like i'm trying to i was trying to think of like if those like count as like win or fail conditions and i think i think i think we can make it work if we need to but if you want to do the barstool prison one i think that's fine yeah that's yeah i think that's the one i'm i'm most interested in i want the light because because what, um, what you're really trying to do is just get through this safely right ultimately right like the two right you know what um okay two light one dark for the uh for the clay ritual so let's have first two one okay 
We rolled a four. The complication is going to be, hmm. Um, I think the complication is going to be that. No. Oh. I think the complication is just going to be that you're like exhausted. And after this, you're going to have to like maybe rest earlier than you would want to. You'll, you'll lose part of the traveling day. If you're okay with that, you can let it ride. Otherwise, you can add a dark die and try again. I like that, especially in how I'm considering narrating it. Okay, good. It's otherwise a success. You and Laura will be able to nap will be able to navigate this. Describe it. So I I scrape some of the earth away to get to the harder earth underneath. And um, and I and I cr- draw a little circle and then a line through the middle of it, and there is like a crack sound from the air and I and I dig my hands under the line like it's a solid thing now and I wrench it up and it's very heavy like a like a really thick blanket and then I put it over my shoulders and I look over at Kel and I'm like come on and then we just start like moving under the earth kind of like it's a blanket but I'm like lifting up the edge of it um so that we can see the trail in front of us to try and but I'm like keeping it low so the bugs are are like colliding with it instead of us but uh, yeah, I, I used my hands to rearrange and, and shape the earth into a more sen- a more solid, dense, like cloth material. I love it. And Gaspar and Laura, you're getting through this because Gaspar is opening himself up like a nest <laughs> um, and allowing the bugs to land on and enter. And that is what's going on. I will say, that eventually both groups will come back together. You will come back together and you will come upon a path, an actual path of stone. The floor perhaps of a long rotted away or collapsed building. And on this path, there are shrines set along either side. Each shrine depicts an effigy of one of the sisters. The sisters are the saints of our world. Each of you in a moment is going to describe the sister who is the patron saint of your occupation. You'll describe finding her shrine here on this path. And you can name her Saint this or Saint that, or you could just call her the holy mother of your occupation, it's up to you. But as you step onto the path, this path is a reprieve from the swarms. In fact, the swarm of bugs is arched over the path like the ceiling of a church or a cathedral, just over it, buzzing. It almost makes the space feel sacred, holy, reverent. I would like everyone to roll ruin. And of course, Laura's is the only one that went up. (laughs) Laura. The canopy of bugs, their constant droning and buzzing, this arch of bugs over this stone path with the shrines. It is almost like music. It's almost like a strange insectoid chorus. And you start to hear singing, very small, very quiet, coming from your own mouth except it's not your voice. It is your tongue 
stretched out, its little antenna bobbing left and right, your tongue swaying back and forth in reverie. You can hear it, tiny little voice singing a tiny little song. Do you keep that secret or do you let the others see? I think at this point, the others almost fade away. They're not the focus here. Laura has her mouth hanging open and this thing is drifting to this music and she's watching, she's listening to the, this, this, this song and she's watching the light glint off the metallic uh, reflections of, of the sunlight shining on the metallic like reflections of the different bugs watching wings beat and it's almost like everything in this forest slows down and focuses in on this archway of bugs for her and she just sort of stands there in awe swaying Gaspar you've already seen Laura's little secret Kel and Torum, you have not. Please roll Ruin as you watch Laura in this moment. How's everyone feeling right now? And no one's Ruin went up, by the way, for people watching. Laura feels great. Gaspar is watching and listening to the song of this creature. He kind of moves into the shadows of one of the statues to, to watch Laura carefully. Um, so Torum was at Ruin 2, so he did increase from the previous instance, but not from this instance. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. We'll come back to that moment then. Yeah. But how do you feel? Uh, unnerved by this strange goings on, but not like, not so much that like it's a breaking point moment. Cal is thoughts? looking very closely and just kind of fascinated because I mean we can hear the song and it's like part of his thing to perform so in any instance I mean he can admire it but it, he's just in awe that, that the magic of the forest is allowing that to happen and just I don't know. I mean, a little impressed, a little creeped out, but yeah, he's just watching in fascination. I love it. You will each find a shrine to the sister who is the patron saint of your occupation. Everyone, please uh, take a moment to describe your shrine. And in particular, do you make an offering at the shrine? And what does that offering look like? I was digging through the loom book, looking at the saints, and I think, yeah, uh, Gaspar finds a, a shrine of Saint Daphine, who is the patron of ditch diggers and trough scrapers, those who dig in the earth, which was his former occupation. Um, and it's uh, it depicts a woman holding a holding a shovel and it's so overgrown with moss that it's hard to make out any features or um, any detail of the face. But Gaspar recognizes it. Um, 
and he sort of lowers himself to the ground before it and puts out his hand and and uh, a small kind of worm-like creature about six or seven inches long crawls from up, crawls from his sleeve and into the moss that's covering this statue and and starts to wind its way up the up the base of the statue that's his offering Um, there is a shrine to Saint Fion, who woodsmen venerate uh, before felling a particularly old tree. Because that's not happening, I'm not I'm not wood cutting out here. I don't feel any need to to make an offering here. Um, but uh, in the old days, woodsmen were were supposed to. Uh, to, to sacrifice some some ancient person uh, to take the ancient tree. I think since then it has been tamed so significantly that they just make an effigy of an old an old person, which is particularly easy for uh, for Torum, which is why he's so successful as a woodcutter because he can just create with clay a, a good effigy and that uh and that has that has helped his his woodcutting career in in a way that other woodcutters are are much slower to be able to, to keep pace. Hell finds the, um, the shrine for, not a saint, but someone he, a deity or a spirit he venerates called Kalesha who represents his occupation of magician. The statue is of a woman with three faces and her robes are carved as if they are floating. And in front of one face, there's a bent hand in front of the other face, it's outstretched. And in front of the third face, the palm is up. Hell goes up to the statue and kneels or gen genuflex a little bit and then goes up to the statue and he has the two rings, his original one and the one that he has from that skeleton. He removes the skeleton's ring and then places it in the hand of Kalesha. Genuflex again, and then faults the ring that's in her hand. That's his offering. Laura, still almost in a trance from this music and watching this, what looks almost like a dance of, of bugs, stumbles towards this statue of Daris, the mother of shadows. And Laura falls on her knees, hands outstretched towards it as if wanting to touch, but not really sure if she should. The bugs swarm around this statue with their wings beating and the light from the sun reflecting off of them, uh, forming almost a canopy around it. And Laura is awed by the beauty of this situation and the intensity of her feelings towards what is happening. And she takes out a 
just a regular knife and slashes at her arm, not so deep to cause permanent harm, but deep enough that she could drip some blood along the altar in front of this statue as one small sacrifice. A moment of reprieve, this beautiful, blessed, holy moment. Four characters in various states of acknowledgement of or offering to the divine. Laura. your tongue, the slug in your mouth is very pleased, well pleased by your righteousness. Kel, the webbing has become quite thick between your fingers and there are now little tiny verdant spiders, like little jewels, little emeralds, crawling in between the spider webs. And Torum, back in Barsul prison, your brother screams as the shadowy jailers slice open bits of his flesh and allow large insects to crawl in between the folds and crawl up and over the muscle tissue. And at that precise moment, you will look down, Torum, and see. You probably feel it first, but then soon enough you see your own flesh ballooning in places as something black and wriggling is crawling beneath it. Praise be to the sisters. And so passes ring two. And that also ends our session. Let's do stars and wishes. Stars are things you enjoyed. Wishes are things you hope to see in the story next time in rings three, four, and five. Whoever wants to go first, take it away. Big star for the atmosphere. I think it's like this creepy forest, swamp, mangrove setting is, you know, it's it's a little it's a little different from the typical kind of haunted forest depiction and that it's kind of hot and sweaty and humid and tropical. Um, but it's you know very evocative. And I really enjoyed the twist with the the bandits being skeletons and I'm I'm into everyone's characters. They're they're really interesting uh, and quite quite varied. Uh, and I think they're playing off each other in interesting ways. I love the the detail of Kel finding the ring that matched her matched his own and Torrum's reaction to Gaspar's creepiness and. I love that Laura has a skill of murder. I think that's uh, that's quite delightful. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Looking forward to looking forward to getting ruined. I, I don't think I've acquired any ruin yet, so that's uh, that's always fun. Um, big stars for for all the characters. Uh, I have a lot of fun with with all of them with Torum's. You're the switch from when, you know, okay, well, what are we doing? What are we doing? Oh, money, huh? Just, it was so good. It was so uh, seamless. And I thought it really made, like, you could really understand that character in that moment. Um, and I thought that was great. Um, I love Gaspar being envious of Laura having this weird slug mouth. That is 
amazing. That was not a reaction I expected. And I, I love it. I love it. It's so good. Um, I love Kel being this oh, almost a little bit ethereal on the side of things, like kind of more on the... Um, Like we all have magic, but Kel is definitely in this other realm of it. And I'm really excited to see what Kel is going to do with those magical powers and what's going to happen to him. Cause I think it's gonna be a lot, um, which is I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, can't wait to get ruined. Um, I want to use my murder skill. I'm excited about that. No plans on it yet, just want to. <laughs> Uh, star for me, I really enjoyed the, um, there was a lot of role play, which I really liked. Uh, you, you all got into like actual like inner character role play pretty quickly. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's obviously an effect of the fact that you all have played together quite a lot, all, quite a lot already before this, but it was still enjoyable and, um, or it was, you know, delightful to see so early and a star for the, um, uh, Rob, for using like your character's nest occupation as the answer to the vermin, that we're like, you know, I thought that was really great. Um, so great that I didn't even need a die roll. I just thought it was really good. And I think it made sense in the fiction. Um, so I love that. And yeah, I, uh, everyone did a great job with the like describing the verses of the song. I thought that was really, really lovely and good. Um, yeah, uh, just the overall vibe is really very trophy dark. So um, that's a that's a winner. It's working for me. I didn't know what to expect at all for this. I mean, like, you know, I, again, read the rules a little bit and then just kind of figure it out. But I mean, this was so good. It just gave me like that. Um, um, well, I mean, folk horror, we've been talking about it and stuff like that. It just like it's just such a creepy ass thing <laughs> in a fantasy world. But not the generic fantasy world i mean it it's just again this this idea of playing to lose and knowing these are such like i want to say flawed but i mean like it's 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 more than that somehow i mean like you know even even torum who who seems like the the most normal out of all of us i mean there's just still some 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 again darkness and the characters aren't heroic i think that's no key. no not at all and then I, I i i find it so interesting because i mean again it's just it it just plays more into the creepiness i mean like again you know being used to role playing as as we do but in a different setting where it just puts the emphasis on something like a line that's just different I, I mean I can't I can't even explain it because it's just it's just like so it it was delicious I don't know how else to explain it darkly delicious it was it was great so I enjoyed myself a lot um like everybody's scenes I mean freaking you know Gaspar and and opening up and and opening him, himself up to accepting the bugs and then Torum with his with his reshaping skills and Laura I mean you know Granted, we haven't seen the murder murder part yet, but I mean, like just the welcoming in of the forest. I mean, that was just amazing. I mean, it. I love it. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, everybody getting into their characterization um, and 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 being able to like play that into a scene ve like very quickly. I think that's one of the that's one of the difficulties of Trophy Dark is it's such a it's such a narrow and scope focused game um, that sometimes that uh, that either comes later or doesn't doesn't feel like it's part of the the big story. But everybody was so on top of it um, that it was like from the beginning, we're already like, all right, I think I understand the group dynamic and um, and and like each person's uh, deal a little bit, even though it's being subtly corrupted by the forest and what we're encountering. Um, I really enjoyed how uh, how Jason was using everybody's um, drive to kind of inform what's happening in a variety of different ways. If it's not you know devil's bargains, it's it, it's 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 in like 
uh, a way that like it's a complication um, to, to the story. That's a good way of using the drives in, in dark. Um, since it is such a short thing, it's like, okay, how do you get that to the table? This is how you get that to the table. And that was really cool. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed everybody leaning into like their occupation or background um, to, to answer the questions. Um, so we had like a good, you know, traitorous cup bearer moment when there's uh, a song coming from the forest and, and informing what, what you were hearing. Um, we have this assassin who's slipping into the shadows in the first scene to go and, and, uh, and scout out. And then we have the, the amazing scene where the nest is like, oh, there's a big flock of bugs, more friends, like welcome them in. And then looking over and seeing their companion horrifyingly have a slug incorporating itself into their mouth and is like, man, I wish that was me. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, and I, and I really enjoyed that everybody was kind of into the magic and doing rituals because sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, like the, the, sometimes the rituals don't get to see much play. Um, but, but it was really cool that like everybody was already was, was kind of doing that. Cause I, I enjoy that kind of, that kind of setting more. So that was really fun for me. Um, but they were like low, lower magics it felt like which is perfect yeah i don't yeah tropey i don't i mean it doesn't it's not like explicit in the rules but i think like the implication is that they are that this is like low powered magic right like it like it's it's subtle you know i mean it's it's called rituals for for a reason it's not a spell right it's more like a a thing i do to make you know a process I go through to make a thing happen, you know, um, which I think again kind of leans on that sort of like full core kind of vibe. It kind of leans into this like natural magic like idea. So yeah, and I thought everyone did a great job with that. Fantastic. Are there any more stars and wishes? I just want to think if there's wishes. Um... I, I hope, I really hope, and I really wish that, that Laura gets the opportunity to, to murder or assassinate. Could be at the end during a, or during a contest role, right? Might be one of you. <laughs> so, yeah. Now I just wanted to just give a further star because I mean, like when everybody was leaning into their, um, into their magic i mean it just gave this very like i don't know i can't i mean because it was low magic but yet it was still there's still some depth there i mean it it just made it seem a little bit more real because it was leaning into the darkness of what the forest was doing to affect us um so i mean I, it just gave this wonderfully creepy ass quality which i totally enjoyed so more of it, more of it. <laughs> yeah, my wish is to see if Gaspar is going to keep pawning off danger to, <laughs> to Laura. <laughs> yeah, send the, send the scout ahead. Yeah, I think now Gaspar needs to, needs to accept some ruin on his own shoulders. Um, but yeah, I'm having a lot of fun just being, just being creepy. Yeah, I love it, it's great. All right, are there any other stars of wishes? Okay, well, in that case, uh, thank you all so much. Um, if you're watching the video, we hope you enjoyed it. Part two will be out soon. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this.